Look, I got earrings and a pretty shirt. A little bat wing. Hello everyone, Scrivener here. Look at that. We're back on that Disney film juice again. This last weekend, there were advanced screenings around the country for Pixar's latest film, Onward. So I decided to treat myself. I got this pin. Shows you how much I love this pin. I haven't even taken it out of the plastic. When Paige and I saw Frozen back in 2014 at the AMC at Downtown Disney, as it was then called, we actually got an Olaf pin just like this one. I've been wondering when I'd get another one. I had fun, so I thought I would review it. Don't worry, there won't be any spoilers in this review. I know it's just come out, so let's get started. The world of Onward is very much like our own, with high schools, highways, and smartphones, but the world is also one of fantasy, with elves, centaurs, and rabid trash unicorns instead of people and raccoons, respectively. There used to be magic and wizards, but as technology progressed, people gave it up in favor of ease and accessibility. The story is about two elf brothers, Ian and Barley Lightfoot, who discover a spell to bring back their dead father for a whole 24 hours. Unfortunately, they only managed to conjure about half of him, like the bottom half. So they have to go on a quest to complete the spell before the 24 hours ends and they lose their chance to talk to their dad. Ian is the main character. He's 16 years old, super awkward, and his dad died before he was born, so he's never met him. Facing the challenges of being an awkward 16 year old high schooler has him especially invested in spending time with his father, learning who he is and how he's like him. Onward is our first Pixar movie of this year. Soul will be the second and will be released on June 19th. Onward definitely feels more Disney Pixar, and Soul looks to be more OG Pixar. Onward was directed by Dan Scanlon, who also directed Monsters University. Scanlon and his older brother lost their dad at a very young age, so young that neither of them really remember him. And when they were teenagers, a relative gave the boys an audio recording of their dad, and that whole experience is what inspired this movie. He wrote the initial screenplay, and in 2019, Jason Headley and Keith Bunin, Bunin, Bunin were brought on to rewrite the screenplay. It was produced by Corey Ray, who was the producer for Monsters University and has been working for Pixar since A Bug's Life. And this is off topic, but her wife is also a producer for Pixar. And I've included a fun interview with them in the description below. I was interested in this film because it looked like there would be a lot of jokes and because the reviews I read kept mentioning this theme of recapturing lost magic, which I thought was very intriguing considering Pixar's general loss of magic over the last decade. From multiple sequels and lackluster films to John Lasseter's predatory behavior, Pixar is not what it once was. So the idea that Pixar was releasing a movie about a world that had once held wonder and magic, grappling with a new mundane kind of world without it, really interested me. Unfortunately, if you've seen the trailer, you pretty much know about 90% of the story. Of course there are emotions and emotional arcs, but not nearly as much as the majority of Pixar films. It brings up some really complex and interesting ideas, but by the time the movie realizes it probably needs to start talking about those ideas, there's about 15 minutes left in the movie. Just... Can't. I have to stop doing that. I'll do it all day. I do want to give a lot of credit to the emotional climax of the film. There's a choice that's made that I thought was really bold and fresh, because in most family movies, we arrive at the most heartwarming and traditional conclusion. No matter how unrealistic or neat it feels, we are given a unilaterally uplifting ending. That's not entirely the case here, and I thought that particular path was probably the most creative idea in the film and it felt the most uniquely Pixar. Again, I'm not saying it has no emotion whatsoever. I imagine that if you have a dead parent, there are going to be things that resonate with you in a way that it just didn't with me. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think specificity is what makes stories interesting. The problem is more that the emotional core shouldn't rely on me having this specific experience to feel emotionally compelled by it. For example, I'm a rambunctious older sibling to a very reserved and sometimes shy younger sibling. The moments where Barley teases, roughhouses, mentors, or embarrasses Ian were relatable to me because of my personal experience with my own little brother. However, the relationship between Ian and Barley is compelling and endearing on its own merit in the film. It doesn't require you to have a similar sibling relationship to care about them. My point is that this movie barely delves into the grief one feels from the absence of someone unknown. It just ponders on it a little bit. <coughs> <coughs> Ugh. 
I have a sore throat, so I need to stay hydrated. I try to be very good about not collecting mugs just for the sake of collecting them, even though I, I like coffee mugs because I don't drink coffee, but um, I have some pretty good ones. I like this one a lot. Onward has a similar kind of revelation toward the end of the movie as Inside Out does, but Inside Out's revelation is alluded to throughout the film, so when it happens it's very satisfying because the work has been done to set up this idea. I don't feel like Onward does quite enough work throughout the film to support its big, tear-jerky realization, though it is still sweet. And the dad thing isn't the only thing that feels like it's been pushed out of a the movie. There's a conflict between Ian and Barley where Barley's feelings are really hurt, and I didn't feel like that was ever quite resolved or meaningfully explored. There's also this recurring concept that the world was magical in olden times when there were lots of wizards and no technology, and conversely, that the modern world that doesn't use magic is, well, less magical because of it. The film tells us that people gave up magic for ease because it wasn't reliable and not even everyone could do it. Normally I would say something along the lines of, rhetoric that largely proclaims assistive technology as lazy and bad often throws disabled people under the bus in favor of selective nostalgia. However, I wouldn't really say that about this film because again, it brings up this idea and then doesn't do anything with it beyond merely stating, the world was once full of magic which I'm fine with because of that ableist stuff, but like, it betrays a bigger writing problem. The thing about Onward is that it's not really interested in the destination, aka arriving at a complex emotional lesson or message. It's interested in a fun and lighthearted journey, and it very much succeeds on that front. It moves pretty fast, the scenes are fun and enjoyable, and the stakes feel quite low the whole time. It's just fun. Pixar is certainly allowed to make lighter films, but it's still worth pointing out that this is a different kind of Pixar film than we're used to seeing. Let's talk about the cast. We have Tom Holland as Ian and Chris Pratt as Barley. I think despite being the main character, Ian's just a bit boring in a, if you've seen one painful awkward and shy teen boy, you've seen this one, kind of way. It's not that Holland does a bad job, I just don't think there's much opportunity for him to shine here in the way he does in other films. Chris Pratt, on the other hand, is fantastic. Barley really plays to his roots as an enthusiastic, confident, lovable goof, but Barley himself is so geeky and passionate and funny that the role for Pratt doesn't feel super repetitive, it's just a good time. Julia Louis-Dreyfus returns for her second Pixar film as their mom, Laurel, her first being Princess Ada in A Bug's Life. She's great, and I really enjoyed the fact that Laurel actually has something to do for the movie. Her presence in this movie isn't mainly the wet blanket or nervous wreck punchline to her son's journey. It's a pretty small cast. You might not remember everybody's names, but the characters are few enough that you'll probably remember everyone you met. And many of these characters are voiced by actors of color. Octavia Spencer's character of the Manticore doesn't show up immediately, but she is present throughout the movie. The cop boyfriend is played by Mel Rodriguez, Ali Wong and Lena Waithe both appear in a fun scene together, and that's a good way to transition into the first openly, canonically, 100% bona fide gay animated character in a Disney movie. <sighs> this is something I knew about going in because, once again, <laughs> Disney wanted to brag about the representation before the movie even came out. So I knew the context, I knew who was voicing this character, and I knew exactly what was going to happen in the scene she appears in. I knew that she was just going to have one line. So I wasn't like disappointed because the movie did exactly what I knew it was going to. Lena Waithe plays this female cop and she has a line where she mentions her girlfriend's kids. And given the context in which she says this line, it will be obvious to anyone who is not just obliviously heterosexual, that she is talking about her romantic partner. As I knew the scene was coming up, I actually felt a bit of nervousness about how my theater might react to the line. I'm glad that no one laughed or booed or anything like that. That was a relief. A very different feeling than the one I got watching, you know, LeFou in Beauty and the Beast, where often LeFou's kind of like effeminate gestures and whatnot are very much played for laughs for the straight audience, and that was uncomfortable. It's never gonna happen, ladies. And I've gotta be honest, I enjoyed this. I, I enjoyed seeing it. At the same time, this is hardly revolutionary. Paranorman gave us the same kind of offhanded, trivial representation eight years ago. Though to Onward's credit, it wasn't a punchline here. 
This is obviously a bit of a recurring thing with Disney, starting with LeFou all the way up to the same sex kiss and Rise of Skywalker. Disney has a very bad habit of really hyping up supposed representation before release, only for it to be revealed that it's not actually unequivocally canon, or it's just a cameo from a straight director that they blew out of proportion, or that kiss was nice, but it would have been so much nicer had you not bragged about how amazing you were for including a gay kiss between two beautiful cis women more than a decade after gay marriage was legalized in the United States. That's what bothers me. Disney continues to really show their ass about this sort of thing in their movies. And it's especially annoying because their TV shows like Annie Mac and Diary of a Future President are kind of killing it with Queer Up, probably because less people watch those, I guess. But it is nice that there'll be a kid who sees Onward and hears that line, and if they have good parents, they'll tell them what that means. I'm glad that Lena Waithe gets to have that honor, and I think that's important, but Queer kids deserve more than a blink and you'll miss it mention, and Disney is clearly capable of much more. They just won't do it. There's another aspect of Lena Waithe's character that I want to talk about. When this announcement came that her character would be gay, a picture of her character was included for the article and circulated on Twitter, and I saw some people making jokes but also genuinely angry that she was an ugly cop. And I think the reasons for being angry about the latter are completely valid but I wanna talk about the former here. Onward does employ racial coding in its character design. Unlike Bright, where the different species largely fall into a single real life racial category, Onward has racial coding throughout species. From black hairstyles to accents, it's subtle, but you pick up on it. I was on Twitter and someone linked to a Tumblr post that brings up a valid point about the differences in how the two characters voiced by black women in the cast are designed versus the primary characters voiced by white people. Overall, the elves are very identifiably human looking. I mean, pretty much everyone pointed out when the trailer was released that Ian looks like a blue linguini from Ratatouille. Did you know that his full name is Alfredo Linguini? <sighs> We've seen this look from Pixar before. The characters voiced by black women, on the other hand, look significantly less human and err more on the side of monstrous. I want to make it clear that I don't disagree with that at all. The difference is subtle, but it is there. Regardless of whether it was intentional or not, it falls in line with the way society generally thinks of and depicts black women. That is, less human. Black characters in animated films have a tendency to... not be human? Black actors in animated films are often found playing literal animals, even in a setting where human beings exist, just rarely black people, for some reason or they'll be humans for a portion of the movie before being turned into animals for the majority of the runtime. This conversation is obviously ongoing, but it was also brought up quite recently when the teaser was released for Pixar's upcoming film Soul, in which Pixar's first black lead seems to undergo a transformation into a blue blob. Blue blob. That's really fun to say, and given the synopsis, he will likely remain a blue blob for most of the movie. Of course, plenty of animated white characters are transformed into animals in movies, but white people also have a plethora of animated human characters. Black people don't! Not even a contest. This is made all the more frustrating by the fact that many of America's earliest animated characters are directly inspired by both the story and visual conventions of blackface minstrelsy. Yep, we're going there. Even characters like Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny, while not racially coded in the way we would recognize today, are patterned after vaudevillian blackface acts. From the music, to Bugs and Mickey's scheming tricks, to exaggerated eyes, to their gloves. Yeah, that's where the gloves come from. Blackface minstrel shows. And audiences at the time would have made that connection. For more information on this, I would highly recommend listening to the episode From Blackface to Black Fishing from NPR's Code Switch podcast. I'll include a link in the description below. Given that history, when designs for black characters go more for insulting, cartoonish, and exaggerated features that conjure up some of these earliest offenders, even a near century later, it's disappointing to see an animation giant like Pixar continue to fail at that sort of representation. At the same time, 
I don't like the argument that Lena Waite's character is ugly because she's got one eye, broad shoulders, big lips, and a big nose, because it assumes that there is an objectively right way to look. There's no such thing as objectively ugly. Our standards of beauty are informed by a cis, hetero, white, thin, abled ideal. And they are fake and wrong and also sprung from the loins of eugenics. There is no such thing as a right way to look. Fat phobia and disfiguramisia and racism and homophobia and transphobia and sexism will tell us that big lips, birthmarks, fat rolls, and unsymmetrical faces are ugly, but they're not. There's a thin line between wanting a marginalized character to not evoke caricature or continue a long history of representation fueled directly by bigotry and body shaming and disfiguramisia informed by European body standards, heteronormative white supremacy, and ableism. Butch queer women like Lena Waithe are often criticized for their looks and are very often seen as conventionally unattractive or ugly. And there's obviously the intersection of Waith being a black butch woman, meaning she doesn't just have to deal with men expecting her to look sexually pleasing to them, but she also has to deal with white people expecting her to try and look less black. Are big lips and hips really ugly, or do we think they're ugly because we've been told that on women of color, they're grossly sexual? Is fatness really ugly, or is it ugly because we think of fatness as an indication of health and wealth? Are facial disfigurements? genuinely ugly, or are they ugly because we associate them with low intelligence? None of which are true things, either. Just for the record. <laughs> My ultimate point is that critiquing this character's appearance should be done in relation to the racist history of black caricature, but it goes deeper than a lukewarm generic tweet like, wow, Pixar made their first queer character an ugly. It implies that the quality of representation is directly proportional to how conventionally attractive you find the character. Expectations inevitably tied to, you know, how white, cis, thin, and straight looking they are. The whole idea that Lena Waite's character in Onward is bad queer rep because she's got one eye and big lips and not because she has one minuscule line is ridiculous. Ugly is subjective. Beauty is subjective. Objective beauty is a false notion. And even if it wasn't, ugly does not mean bad. People are not bad because they are ugly and vice versa. This isn't the f Wizard of Oz. Only bad witches are ugly. We are better than this, Glinda. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so that was that was obviously a lot. If you're still watching, thanks. I know that was quite a bit of discussion for a character that appears for maybe five minutes of the runtime. The time that I devoted to that discussion is not really indicative of what I think of the movie overall. <laughs> Onward isn't that deep. It's more that it's something I wanted to talk about, and this was a very good way to do that. Before I give my final takeaway, here is a list of short things I wanted to mention but that I couldn't really fit elsewhere. Keep an eye out for when they visit the gas station. The name is hilarious. <laughs> it's definitely my favorite pun, you'll understand. Keeping in mind my critique about the racial stuff earlier, um, I liked the character designs. I thought they were fun, they were very expressive, and that lended really well to the comedy. I appreciated that the humor tended more towards timeless physical and situational comedy rather than pop culture references. It's not like I really expected pop culture references from Pixar, but physical comedy is something they've gotten really good at, especially in the last decade, and I enjoyed that. That being said, I would have liked more jokes. I'll definitely be seeing it a second time, and I'm hoping that my experience will be enhanced by watching with a more reactive audience. Instead of a Pixar short, there is a Simpsons short. It was funny. I liked it. I really enjoyed the use of music throughout. It did help the film to feel very modern and recognizable. This is not Pixar's best. This isn't something I'm going to recommend to people who only go to the theater for really exceptional movies. The premise has some real potential, but it doesn't get anywhere near the emotionally satisfying storytelling that Inside Out or Coco does. I wouldn't even really call this a tearjerker. It just doesn't do enough. Nevertheless, I did enjoy it. It's perfectly competent, light fare. This is obviously a new kind of era for Pixar, and I think they could do a lot worse, but they could also do a lot better. If you're looking for something fun and breezy to watch with friends and family, Onward is perfect. 
it probably won't wow you, but it's fun and the animation is good. Thank you so much for watching! I also want to thank Princess Weeks for reading over my thoughts about Lena Waithe's character. She had some really good feedback that made that section a lot stronger, so go watch one of her videos and follow her on Twitter. If you enjoyed this review and analysis, go ahead and give this video a like. Leave a comment below if you're thinking of seeing it, or tell me your thoughts about Diary of a Future President Episode 7. Definitely alluded to some more queer stuff, right? I mean, like, I'm not the only one that saw that. And subscribe to The Princess and the Scrivener for more videos on Disney, intersectional feminism, pop culture critiques, movie reviews, and more. The Princess and I will see you real soon. It is a bat wing. It's a bat. It's a neon bat. Should I try and wear this? It's really big. Like, for scale.